Right, let's do this. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, today we're here to celebrate the book launch of our, the debut novel of our debut novelist, Anne Freeman. Uh, yes. Returning to Adelaide, which is an absolute joy to read. Um, but before we do anything, I um, would like to uh, acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, uh, who are the traditional custodians of this land, and we pay our respects to the elders of the Kulin Nation, past, present and emerging, and we'd like to extend that respect to any other First Nations people who are here. Uh, let me introduce your panel, you're in for a treat. Um, <laughs> here we have Anne Freeman, whom you all know and love. She is a mother of two, she's a multitasker, she does everything Everything that she does touches, everything she touches turns to gold. So she does everything well. It's amazing. Um, and she's also the mother of two books. So not just this one, ladies. She's backed it up with another one. Um, it's not published yet. Oh, wow. I, I, I believe it will be. <laughs> and I was right about the first one too, wasn't I? Um, so she is visibly shaking. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, okay, and so Returning to Adelaide is her debut novel. Um, and then next we have Dr. Tori Miller. She is a clinical psychologist, principal practitioner, and associate director at the Melbourne Wellbeing Group, uh, program de development director at the Inspiring Girls Australia, co-host of Breaking the Rules podcast, which launches next Tuesday and will be available on Spotify and all the other places you can get podcasts. So keep a look out for that. It's called Breaking the Rules. Um, and she's also a mother of two. Um, and then we have at the end of the table, Suzanne Dekevia is the principal at The Dressing Coach. She does really, really interesting work as well. She's an image consultant and fashion stylist, and she helps her clients get an alignment between how they present themselves and, and their authenticity, their intention. I'm going to be facilitating a, a very, very interesting discussion about some of the themes that we see in Returning to Adelaide that you may well relate to. Um, so let's start, shall we? Um, the first question is for Anne, our, our novelist, and it's about um, and how you wrote this book. Can you give us a bit of a, a, a download of... You, you had two kids under three when you started writing this novel. Can you explain to us what was going on please? Yes. Um, please stand. Please stand. Oh, yes, shall please I stand? Please. Yes. She's a tall drink of water. <laughs> Adjust your cameras <laughs> to portrait mode. Um, I have to say, I think it's Tori's fault. Um, I remember distinctly, Tori and I, our children are very close in age and we were uh, sitting out at a cafe one sunny day nursing our little babies in arms that were probably about six months old and just talking about what happened. What happened? <laughs> what life is this? What, where, where have I gone? Um, you know, as in early motherhood, I think that my body was an instrument of comfort cuddling my children, um, breastfeeding my daughter constantly. She was, you know, whew, she was a fan, let's just say. <laughs> um, and my intellect was sort of decommissioned um, and there was nothing really for myself. There was no shred of who I used to be before. Um, I was just kind of, you know, in the trenches in that early motherhood. And, you know, like, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of years about the difficulties of lockdown. It's so hard being at home, not much to do the problem of, you know, too much time. Um, and I think early motherhood is really interesting because I had, as I said, uh, as Marion said, two children under three. So the nap schedule, and a lot of people are probably in this moment now where you have a little baby who's napping twice a day and you have a toddler who's napping once a day and it's at different times and you cannot leave the house. <laughs> you know, unless you have babies that can nap on the go, you can't leave the house. You're constantly putting someone to sleep. And as I say, my body was at work, you know, an instrument of comfort, but also an instrument of utility. And my mind was just not utilised. And oh my God, but did I crave something. And I was saying to Tori, you know, when the kids are at school, maybe I'll study. And I'm dreaming of this life <laughs> when my kids were, would be a bit older. 
And I was really putting my life on hold until then. And that was years away. You know, Edie, my littlest, who was the babe in arms, she's just a four-year-old kinder now. So I was putting my life on hold for another year or two from now. And Tori has a very annoying way of asking you questions <laughs> that make you actually consider what it is you want, which is very inconvenient. <laughs> and so she just said to me, well, you know, if, if you want to study, what would you study? And I went, writing. <laughs> I've always been interested in writing. I've always played with words in a safe space, which is to say, in a place where no one would read them ever. And I thought, well, I'm going to study writing. So Tori, again, with the questions, she said to me, what can you do today to put yourself on track for that dream? Which is just, again, it's very annoying. Being held accountable for your own happiness. Um, and so it got me thinking, what could I do? And so I started reading books on writing craft, listening to some podcasts, and I remember the first writing craft book that I got was about how to write a novel, you know, like an idiot's guide. <laughs> and I said to my husband, Paul, um, not that I'm going to write a novel, like I'm just reading this book because, you know, Tori said that I should, you know, like fill my well and I'm just going to do that. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. The only problem was by the end of reading it, I said to Paul, oh, now I have to write a novel. <laughs> And so I set myself a daily word goal of 400 words. I wrote most of it while I was breastfeeding Edie because um, it was the only time I sat down and I wrote it in my iPhone because that is a thing you can do. You can write a novel just with your thumb. <laughs> and, you know, if you write a little bit every day and you don't wait for the perfect time to write, then eventually you have 80,000 words and then you can set about making those... 80,000 words a bit less shit than they were when you wrote them in your iPhone. <laughs> and that's how that happened. <laughs> just like that, that's how it happened. I was like, I, I had to put myself in a dark room to breastfeed so that I, I could concentrate and the baby could concentrate. <laughs> there was no writing novels on my iPhone at all. Um, so, and you laid the, the foundation of, of the, the big theme that runs through this book, which is that metamorphosis of motherhood, where you kind of lose something. You, you gain so much, but you lose something of yourself. Um, can, you, can you explain um, at where Adelaide is at? She's got two, she's got twins at the age of five. She's just about to come into this new kind of um, time where, where her kids go to school and everything. Um, but where is she at? Yes, yeah, so, you know, as I said, with my own um, experience, I was sort of waiting for that golden time of having children at school and having, the, you know, the hours of 9 till 3.30 in which to do whatever you want. And so I've put Adelaide at the, at the precipice of that moment. Um, and to give a little bit of context, Adelaide's pregnancy, which resulted in twins, was um, a surprise pregnancy, let's say. So she's gone from um, tertiary study, planning this, you know, life of, um, you know, international fabulousness. She's a, she's a, a textiles expert. Um, so she's, you know, applying to different galleries around the world. And she finds out that she's pregnant after believing that she would not be able to have children. So she sort of harnesses this, um, this eventuation. And she goes into early motherhood like we do. Um, I know I've got at least one friend here with twins, so let's just tip our hats to multiple <laughs> pregnancies because it's hard enough with one. And really when I was writing this, I thought, you know, how can I make Adelaide like really, <laughs> really busy and really stressed and with really no time to herself, twins. <laughs> Shout out to Vicky. Anyway. <laughs> And so she thinks that she's on the, on the brink of being able to have some time back to herself, some time to invest in her marriage as well. Um, you know, she's coming out of the haze, out of the trenches, and at that point in time, her husband announces that he no longer loves her, never did, and is having an affair with bloody Kim from HR. <laughs> <laughs> bloody Joe. <laughs> 
Um, I, I wanted to uh, direct the next question to Tori. Um, as a psychologist, can you can you explain a little bit to us what actually happens to women when they they embark on this motherhood journey, and why is it so hard for some? Um, well, look, it's pretty. It's a you know, it's a short question with a really long answer. Um, look, it's really multifaceted because I think. At part, at a biological level, we are designed in a way, I mean, you know, there have been some outstanding advances in research where, you know, studies doing MRIs of, of women um, in the early, after they've had a baby and then in subsequent years are, are demonstrating that, you know, the brains of, of mothers are changing, you know, through the experience. And part of the theory and the parts of the brain that are, that are changing is partly about the theory is, is that actually we're supposed to kind of close down so that we can keep our babies alive, so that we can attend to them and um, and hold them in mind. But then we also know that, you know, in addition to the biology, we also, um, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard the term matrescence, but it's this lovely theory that, you know, the, the journey of motherhood is kind of akin to adolescence. You know, it's a developmental phase, you know, with significant hormone shifts and body changes and... Uh, um, <laughs> and you know a shift it to... doesn't change back, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah. That's right. You know that. You know it does. And our bodies do change. And actually, you know, we're we're designed to sort of go through this shift in sort of concept of self, where we are. You know, our, our parts of ourselves are adapting and shifting, and other parts are growing. And there's sense of uncertainty, ambivalence, not knowing. And then, you know, all of these things this, are happening at the same, under the umbrella of societal constraints, um, societal pressure, pressure to bounce back, pressure to, oh, you know, the Madonna and the whore complex, you know, that we're supposed to be pure and, and, uh, and giving and selfless and, um, and unwanting, you know, and, and just to serve um, our, our children. And so it's a really, really complex time. And so for all of those reasons, you know, in time, we're so, you know, in a sense, we're designed to lose ourselves. But I think then what, what is tricky is that we are not then given the space to find ourselves where there is an enormous amount of sort of uh, shame around the loss of self um, as though we're supposed to just, you know, either fully lose ourselves in motherhood and that is supposed to be our new identity, you know, and that is not healthy, you know, for us or our children to be entirely lost in our children. Our identities can't grow, neither can theirs. But it's also, you know, it's you know, there there are just so many constraints on us, and I don't think we give ourselves the time. Like, you know, matrescence, like adolescence, is a journey, and we're not really sure where, where matrescence ends because, you know, there are so many time points in motherhood, infancy, toddlerhood, the primary school, secondary, adulthood. You know, the you know the journey, the journey keeps going on, and and I think that that's one of the great struggles I think around identity development is that it is ever shifting. But we're taught that it shouldn't be, and it should be actually really clearly defined, and that it is a shameful thing to lose it, or to not be happy, or to when we shouldn't be sitting with ambivalence, which is actually sort of part of the deal, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember you saying, Tori, that when you had Lil, when Tori had her first child, mm -hmm. you kind of felt this pressure to act as though it was business as usual. Yeah. Like nothing has changed, like particularly to friends without children. Yeah. yeah. And just be like, I'm just getting on with it and it's fine. Yeah, like I'm in this like, cool cafe yeah. and we're sitting here and like sure my baby's here, but it's not like they're not really here. You know, and nothing is different. <laughs> I would love The ramp lowered like a medieval drawbridge, providing tantalizing glimpses of the island as the vessel bogged. Crystalline waters glittered and sparkled like sequins on a flapper's hemline and gave way to rows of chalky white buildings which glowed luminescent in the bright sunshine. The excited anticipation of the passengers was palpable and Adelaide was squeezed in the front line by the overzealous throng. The ramp had barely kissed the pier when the wave of eager passengers swept forward. Adelaide was almost knocked down by a boisterous group of American teenagers. She pressed herself close to the rail, unable to grasp it to steady herself, laden as she was with her handbag, vanity case and suitcase. Then, at the precise moment the wheels of her suitcase were traversing the ridge between ferry and ramp, Adelaide was flung sideways like a bowling pin by a tank of a woman who was waving her arms madly about her head in greeting to someone awaiting her. 
Adelaide's ankle gave way. Dropping her belongings, she grabbed for the rail, watching as her suitcase slipped neatly through a narrow gap in the railing. It bounced off the rudder with a sickening crack, and Adelaide watched in horror as all her clothes burst forth and were tossed about in the breeze like carnival bunting. It occurred to her in that moment that she detested all those clothes, all those colourless, shapeless clothes she had accumulated to make herself blend in, go unnoticed. She dressed how she thought a wife and mother should, and she hated it. Oh, wow. So I'd like to address the next question to Suzanne. Being a stylist and helping clients just refine their style and refine the way that they are authentic through the way that they present themselves, you have a, a, actually a, a similar story or you have a client story um, that sort of uh, mirrors that. Can you tell us about it, please? Yes, it was um, very sad. It was, um, well, it came from a very sad event. It ended up being quite a... a beautiful friendship that I formed with this client, but it was back um, in the last very bad bushfires uh, that were out at Marysville and things, and this lady came to me and she rang me and she had nothing. she lost everything in the bushfire. She was um, late 50s, she would have been. She had uh, three backpackers that were staying with her from Germany, so she had their lives to protect, so she... Um, was concerned, obviously concerned about them, bundled them up, made sure that they had waterproof um, bags around their neck that had their passports and identification and um, a backpack for them, and she put them in the dam. Oh, I'll get all emotional now. Yeah. Um, she put them in the dam um, because that was the safest place, and then she uh, got in there herself. She didn't even have a bra on, nothing. She just had like a T-shirt dress on because it was so hot. Anyway, the, uh, her husband was off fighting the fires and the fire went through and burned their house to the ground and actually went over the dam. But they were all um, saved. So she had nothing, not even a bra. And uh, so off she went to what she coined the refugee centre <laughs> where we were all donating clothes and things for these um, ladies and men. And uh, she went and got some clothes. Then she decided that everybody was getting um, psychologists and psychiatrists and um, seeing doctors and counsellors and all that sort of thing, and she decided that that wasn't to her. So she had this. Uh, so she had some a basic, very basic few pieces that she got from the refugee centre. She decided that the counsellor and the psychologists and the doctors and things weren't for her because she had the same realisation that Adelaide had that she actually wasn't sad. There were a lot of things in her house, don't get me wrong, that she was very sad that she'd lost. But her wardrobe was not one of them. <laughs> her clothes were not one of those things that she's like, oh my God, I'm really sad that I've lost, blah, blah, blah. So she decided she was going to get an image consultant. So she came and saw me and she said, because now I've got the opportunity to start from scratch and build a wardrobe that is full of things that express who I am and that bring me joy and that I love wearing. And that was the journey that I went on with her. Mm -hmm. so. That's awesome. Thank you. Suzanne, so this is not a this is not a um, a shallow thing, is it? But no. how we present ourselves and how important that is to us and our our identity. No, not at all. And most of the women it's, it's I have um, a lot of women too that I see as clients that come through and they may be in their middle 50s or something, and it's exactly what you were saying, Tori. It's still that motherhood thing, but now their children have left home, and they still don't know who they are. Mm. And they might be changing careers. They might be taking, uh, starting a new career, or taking on a new role, or starting a new business. And they've got a wardrobe full of clothes, but nothing to wear. Mm. And they'll say to me, I actually don't know who I am. I don't know how I'm supposed to dress, so can you tell me what I'm supposed to wear, what am I supposed to do? And so it becomes this journey of, well, who are you? you know, who are you on the inside? What makes you tick? What are the things that bring you joy? Because in my world, getting dressed every day should be a source of joy, mm. a freedom to express who you are from the inside and what you want and what makes you happy and not worry about what other people think or other people are wearing or... Mm. You know, because 
in my opinion, the people that are doing all of that are the people that are dreadfully unhappy in themselves. So they're so busy judging other people. So, yeah, just be happy. Love what you wear. <laughs> I experienced something as well which ties into what you're saying, Suzanne, is that I expected that as a mother I should now act in a certain way. I should dress in a certain way. I should be playground ready, bare face, no makeup. And I, God, I tried. <laughs> I tried. And it, I mean, it wasn't a good feeling. You know, I mean, forget about the look. It wasn't a good feeling. And, you know, this idea of, um, you know, mothers wearing active wear. Like, if you're happy in your active wear, do it. But, oh, my God, I couldn't do it. And I thought, I am broken. I am not a real mother. I am doing something wrong here. This is a reflection of my superficiality. This is a reflection of my vanity. There is something not right with me if I can't go to Aldi in my active wear with no makeup on, you know, with the pusher full of my 17 you children. You fascinated Aldi? <laughs> yes, I have been known to wear a fascinator to Alton. <laughs> <laughs> and that, Jessica, was my true self. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's a process um, of understanding what gives you joy and then how to actually act that out. And you always knew that, Anne. You always knew what gave you joy. Um, I thought it was the wrong things giving me joy. You know, it's that questioning yourself. And, and, and I don't know, just I think we're, we're all kind of, we all have the tendency to worry if we're doing a good job. Yeah, like, is this what I'm supposed to be? Is this how, should I be feeling this way? Um, you know, and I, I mean, I did it to myself again in the 2020 lockdown. I threw myself into the well-being of my children. Um, I'm going to have a... Where's the tissue box? Can we set this room up? No, I'm fine. I can hold it in. Um, but, you know, I threw myself into the well-being of my children, worrying about them. Um, anybody who is friends with me on Facebook will know that it was... It was a party for all of 2020 at my house. It was craft party, it was dance party, it was food party. I literally would be like, we're having an ice cream party this weekend. And I would set that up because I was wanting to shield them from the reality of the world. But I forgot to do anything like that for myself. And I burnt out. Um, and it was an incredible... <laughs> you were promised, like, a light... Discussion. <laughs> We're rolling deep now, people. <laughs> um, but I totally forgot about myself again. You know, like I wrote the book and then immediately just forgot about Adelaide and what we can learn from her. <laughs> you know, it's so it's so tempting to look at these children who you love and you want to protect and you want them to be happy and their well-being above all else, but you forget or at least I did, mm. and I see some head nods, <laughs> you forget that as their primary carer, you need to be okay in order to look after them. Mm. And that is a big piece of the puzzle that I totally forgot, to my detriment. Mm. Mm. Um, the difference between you and Adelaide, the, the major difference is that you have a... She's at average height. <laughs> <laughs> so Adelaide, just for context, Adelaide's like a really good version of me. <laughs> like way better. But aren't you happy that you, that you are Anne Freeman, that you have a husband who encourages you... No Kim. Um, Kim, that's no, no Kim. Um, who, uh, who's encouraged you to really um, grasp that authenticity that you're seeking. Oh, it. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, whereas in, in the novel, we, we actually see that Adelaide is um, uh, not being encouraged at all. And this is why she actually loses part of herself is because she does, she's not surrounded by... I mean, she's got some best friends, but her husband... Yeah, but based off actual people. <laughs> <laughs> but she, she has a husband who doesn't encourage her, and, and that's actually a, a, a big part of that as well, why, why she loses. Yes. So let's talk and about... Yeah, I just want to say there's a line in there which I think sums it up well, not to be like, check out my words, guys, they're, like, really amazing. Um, but she... Is she spent her whole marriage trying to be indispensable to Joe, and she realizes that actually through the 
through that work, she's become invisible to him. So she's tried to provide him with this charmed life and succeeded to the point where he doesn't even see her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so talk to us about um, Adelaide's best friends and whether there are some similarities. <laughs> maybe. I'm, 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 I'm not sure. <laughs> so yes. Um, I mean, look. I think you know people take from life, like writers take from life. We're like, you know, those little um, crows that pick up shiny things and take them back to the nest. That's us, constantly collecting. So, yes, thank you. Um, And so, yes, Adelaide's um, best friend, Rosemary, is, um, you know, sort of based on some very strong um, relationships in my (laughs) life. (laughs) I've given... Um, I've given Rosemary Tory's physical characteristics, so she has a face like sunshine and um, a halo of red curls. Um, but certainly it's a sort of amalgamation of all my female friendships. Um, I was thinking that um, there's a line of dialogue where her best friend Rosie says, oh, you know, I'm so over here in my crazy bubble, I don't even know what's going on in your world. And that's Lissy's words. <laughs> that's the kind of thing that Lissy would say. So there's a little bit of lots of different mm. friendships in there, mm. um, which I hope lends some authenticity to the relationship. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it certainly does. Um, so I wanted to ask that this shape shifting that um, Adelaide really, really struggles with between being a desirable woman and being a mother. And Tori, you you talked a little bit about it, the mm. the Madonna versus the whore. Um, can you? Give us a little bit more of, of what that entails. I mean, sure. I mean, I think um, well, we're talking about, you know, how women have been conceptualised for a really long time, you know, sort of the idealised, well, particularly in the concept, context of motherhood and sexuality, I think, you know, that, mm-hmm. that women are up on pedestals, idealised, you know, um, uh, idealised as being, you know, um, un- women who don't desire sex or, or want to be sexual and they're actually sort of sensual because they, they don't desire sex and they're almost pure and are, um, and they are selfless and so they're really idealised. And then there's the, the opposite of that, which is the whore, where, you know, sex is dirty and, um, and you're, you're not valued. And the, the space in the middle is the space that I think that, you know, the, the women have been trying to reclaim for a really long time. Which is the space where you know um, women and uh, femininity and sexuality are all interwoven again, and I think that you know we're still coming up against a huge amount of societal pressure. We still you know have a lot of pressure to adopt certain roles. I think it's really tricky because you know the physicality of giving birth, of recovering from childbirth, of of feeding, of of caring, of of being you know sleepless and tired. <laughs> I think that there is something about that that just lends a woman to not feeling very sexual, the body changing, feeling uncertain, feeling ambivalent, you know, not wanting any more touch or any more attention from anybody. You don't look like you're old enough to have a daughter that would know Mm. how to dress, you know, because I'm thinking, you only look like your early 30s, you know. And I said, oh, do you mind if I'm asking, how old is your daughter? And she said, oh, she's amazing. She's got the most amazing eye for detail and putting things together. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. How old is she? Four. Oh! Oh, my amazing! And I sat there and I don't think I would speak for a couple of moments because I was like, oh, you really, like you said, you've lost yourself so much that it's your children are now telling you how to dress. Yes, yes. yes. And it was very sad. sad. That's why yeah. Gorman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of the day. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and it was very sad. And I said, but is that who you really are? I mean, that's okay if you want to dress in pink and purple and sequins. Mm. You know, it's and chul, chul. I love chul and I love yeah. sequins. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to judge very guys. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> But it's not going to be appropriate to all situations and things. So, yeah, I think it very much is. And I think it comes back to being strong enough to be who you are on the inside. And I think that's the source of a lot of happiness or disharmony and things because if we're not happy with who we are 
and we're dressing as someone else or trying to do something to please other people, we're not happy. We're really not happy. And so the minute that we start to find ourselves and dress who we are and be ourselves, we might lose people along the way. But in my book, that ain't so bad because they weren't your tribe anyway. Yeah, 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 that's right. They weren't your tribe. Yeah. So you're much better off to honour who you are and dress for you and then you find your tribe. I don't know anything about finding my tribe, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> um, there is so much more to this book. So the met metamorphosis of motherhood is, is really a big theme in it, but it's not the only theme that we would relate to. Um, Adelaide is then uh, transported to um, the Greek islands where she um, catches up again with an old flame. Ooh. And um, I'm, I'm going to, <laughs> there is a smouldering sex scene, and I think we'll, we'll finish on this note. There is a smouldering sex scene in this. Can you very briefly tell us about, you know, was it hard to write, but also what's going on for Adelaide? This is a turning point for her. Well, you know they say you should write what you know. <laughs> also, unrelated, I just want to thank my husband <laughs> He's always been very supportive of my writing. <laughs> but, you know, I think as a reader, I don't want the camera to pan away when the protagonist kisses the love interest and then the next morning she awoke and he brought coffee. No, mate! <laughs> what happened? <laughs> the nitty gritty. Yes. Be the change you want to see. Here. Okay? So this is a 2,000 word sex scene. You all, look, you're going to need a lie down. <laughs> when you get to the middle of the book, pour yourself a glass of wine, put on a scented candle, and you won't be disappointed. I think that's a really good place to leave it.